that there is it is ordered and it is periodic. <coughs> it is ordered not only positionally, but it is also orientationally ordered whenever we are considering the motif to have certain orientation and it is periodic. In the case we consider here, you can clearly see that the magnetization vectors are ordered orientationally. That means, they are all pointing in the same direction. <coughs> in this case of course, we can think of it as the 0 0 1 direction in B C C ion. <coughs> Therefore, the order we are talking about here can be orientational or positional and the crystal being considered has in the strictest sense orientational order and positional order. Often in real crystals as we shall see lot of these criteria which are imposed on ideal mathematical crystals are relaxed and therefore, we may have crystals of various degrees of relaxed definitions which we shall consider later. There are other forms of matter and the other extreme to crystals are what are called amorphous or glassy materials or glasses in which case there neither there is positional order nor there is orientational order. Therefore, it can be thought of as a material at best having short range order, but definitely not long range order. <coughs> of course, when I am defining a crystal and I am defining a crystal if based on a combination of both a geometrical entity and a physical property, it might so happen that one of the two is ordered and the other is disordered. For instance, suppose I take the same ion above the Curie temperature. So, suppose I am talking about iron crystal above the Curie temperature in spite of the atoms vibrating about their mean lattice position we consider them to be positionally ordered, but you can clearly see that the magnetization direction which was all along the same direction has will be lost and this crystal will go from a ferromagnetic state to a paramagnetic state in which case <coughs> we will find that with respect to the physical property now it has become disordered. Therefore, when I am defining a crystal I have to define it either based on the physical property or the geometrical entity or both and when I am talking about disordering or amorphousness it can come from either the physical property or the geometrical entity and therefore, we could have a material which is completely crystalline like the case of B C C and above Curie temperature with respect to the atomic positions, but it is definitely disordered with respect to the physical property and especially the spin orientation. <coughs> Further to these important states of matter like crystalline and uh, amorphous materials, there is a third class of um, materials though not that well studied or that uh, uh, well applied in terms of its engineering applications, they are the quasi crystals. They are in the international tables of crystallography classified under higher dimensional crystals. In other words, they are sometimes considered as part of crystals themselves, but here we have given them a separate position because they represent a definitely a third state of matter. And in some sense, I have to understand this picture of atomic structure as consisting of crystalline, quasi crystalline and amorphous phases. Added to that, there is an other class of important class of materials which are between liquids and crystals which we have shown here, which is liquid crystalline materials and as all of you know that many of the displays in calculators etcetera are made from liquid crystals, they are the LCD displays or what is called the and as we can see later on during the course that any one of these entities 
we are talking about the crystallites or the amorphous regions in a matrix etc could turn nano crystalline that means that i need to know my basics regarding these atomic orderings of matter and then i go to the next level which is my understanding that some of these length scales in these could become nano another way of classifying atomic form of matter is using the concept of a band structure <laughs> based on the band structure a material can be a metal it can be an insulator or it can exist in one of the intermediate states like what is known as a semi metal or a semiconductor now when we are talking about the band structure it should be clear that one way of classification should not clash with any other way of classification of matter for instance a material could be amorphous and still could be metallic in other words that is what we call the metallic glasses and now we have they have produced a materials which are bulk metallic glasses in other words which have a large cross section of area or large volume of material which is fully amorphous but is metallic <coughs> a material could be an insulator but could be also be amorphous for example we know our silicate glass it is typically a very good insulator but it is amorphous <coughs> on the other hand a material could be a crystal and could be a metal for example copper is crystalline and as we will see that it is actually not single crystalline but typically a copper conductor wire consists of many crystals in many orientations which we call a polycrystalline material and therefore copper wire is polycrystalline but it is metallic we can also consider many ceramics like silicon nitride etc which are also polycrystalline but not good conductors therefore one way of classification classification should not clash with another way of classification <coughs> like for instance mercury is liquid at room temperature but mercury is a metal that means it's a good conductor of electricity and essentially what we are talking about there <coughs> from the band structure perspective i am classifying mercury to be a metal but from a liquid from the flow properties or the viscosity properties i classify to be a, a liquid therefore when am i making a classification we should be clear that what is the basis of the classification and we should be able to assign materials to, into each one of these boxes based on the classification we are considering <coughs> good examples of semiconductor would be silicon germanium solid solutions of silicon and germanium etc <coughs> semi metals are those in which there is a band gap but the band gap is across the k space in other words if you are considering an integration across k space then you don't have a band gap <coughs> but there is a band gap suppose you are considering a single k value at another way of classification of matter which is very very important from this course perspective is what is we call the classification based on size <coughs> each one of these entities we have talked about could actually end up in the nano size for example and we will uh, of course this set of lectures as you can see is a revision and sort of a consideration of the basics once again and some of these things would would be defined would have been defined in previous uh, fundamental lectures before for you therefore based on size we can have nano crystals we can have nano liquid crystals if you want we can have nano quasi crystals we can even have regions which are amorphous but have a very small spatial extent which we can call, if, call for instance nano amorphous if you like we could have for instance an insulating matrix in which we could embed a metallic particle in other words here based on size it's also it is nano additionally it is also nano from the perspective of being a metal which is or a conducting band structure that there are regions which are nano therefore i can take each one of these entities in this diagram and make it nano for instance i could have a nano droplet which is residing on a substrate in a gaseous environment so let me draw a schematic of that <coughs> 
So, here I have considered a glass substrate on which nano droplets of water have condensed from the vapor phase and assuming that there is an equilibrium existing, then I can visualize that there is water here and there is water as droplets and this size of the droplets is what is nano in this and when I am saying nano typically it I am using it in the more general sense of the definition which means that the size is of the order of nanometers. Therefore, I can think of the of these droplets if I take an individual droplet think of this dimension to be in the nanometer regime maybe a few tens of nanometers or a few hundreds of nanometers. Therefore, I can take each one of these entities in this picture and can visualize that they are in the nano scale. I can in fact invert this problem and I can take a glass substrate in which there are the vapor phase is in nano scale. I can put small bubbles of water vapor So, I am visualizing here certain gas bubbles or vapor bubbles which are entrapped in a glass matrix which are of the nano scale. Therefore, let me summarize this slide for you. In the previous slide we saw that a phase which is here we are restricting ourselves to those phases which are made of atomic species and when I mean atomic species I am talking about atoms, ions, molecules, cluster of atoms etcetera. These atomic species can form based I can define a phase based on geometrical entity or a physical property. Now, <coughs> atomic matter can be classified in various ways and all these classifications are important especially when we are talking about finally, addressing the questions of important questions like what is nano in a nano structure or what is nano in a nano material or what is so important about nano. So, based on state or viscosity we have the gas solid liquid picture based on atomic structure we can have amorphous crystalline or quasi crystalline states of matter and there are intermediate states between the important phases like the crystalline and the liquid states which we can be called thought of as liquid crystalline state. We also seen that based on band structure we, we can have metals, semi metals, semiconductors and insulators and as we know that in case of metals the valence band overlaps with the conduction band that means an infinitesimal amount of energy which is supplied can or a small amount of energy which is supplied can actually take promote an electron to an higher energy level and the, because there is no band gap. In the case of insulator there is actually a band gap between the valence band and the conduction band and usually if the va value of this band gap is small then you call it a semiconductor. In other words in a semiconductor even at room temperature you would find that many electrons have been promoted from the valence band to the conduction band and therefore, a semiconductor at room temperature would show some conductivity. The important difference between a semiconductor and a metal being that a metal's conductivity degrades with temperature while a semiconductor's conductivity increases with temperature. Based on size which is very pertinent to this course, we can think of some of this we, we are actually picking terms from the uh, figures above. We can have nano crystals, nano quasi crystals, nano liquid crystals and as we have seen here we can have nano vapor phases etcetera. Uh, very good question, um, Mr. Anil Kumar has a very important question when you are talking about nano is it purely a length scale problem, is it an issue related to properties as we shall see very soon and we will specifically address this very question using a lot of slides <coughs> that it is both. Often in a more loosest sense we would we would define something to be in a nano structure or nano material based on some length scale in the problem as we shall see it is often not everything which is in the material which is nano it is particularly well defined uh, part of the system which is in the nano scale we call it a nanometer. So, typically you would talk it about tens or at best hundreds of nanometers. But that does not make it interesting for us to study these materials. It is not going to give me benefit if going to this scale of say 100 nanometers would give me some special properties. 
Therefore, we will see that <coughs> unless there is a benefit of properties, it is not worth taking trouble to go down to the nano dimensions, because as we shall see towards end of this introductory chapter that there are a lot of disadvantages nanomaterials also, there are a lot of challenges still which are open to us and therefore, we need to address the effort versus benefit issue before we go to nano scale. And therefore, in the truest sense as you I think have implicitly pointed out, it is the properties which is going to tell you that it is nano or not. And we will also see cases examples wherein there is nothing in the material which is in the nano scale, but the materials property behaves in the nano way. And so, we will take up those examples also wherein this specific question which we have uh, asked here would be clearly exemplified. And that would be very very important for us because when there is a benefit in properties and as we shall see very soon that not only there are often benefits in properties, but there are absolutely new properties arising when you go down to the nano scale which have no counterparts in the bulk. So, I can mention some names for you for instance, we have the phenomena of super paramagnetism or we have the phenomena of giant magneto resistance. <laughs> so, these have no bulk analogs that means, I cannot typically realize uh, super paramagnetism in an ion particle which is of the order of millimeter size. I need to get down to the nano dimension before I even see this pro, uh, phenomena known as super paramagnetism or if I am talking about <coughs> giant magneto resistance the length scale in the problem has to be reduced before it becomes uh, viable for me to or it becomes the phenomenon of super paramagnetism source of. Therefore, whenever I am talking about uh, nano materials or nano signs, even though I am talking about size in the what you may call in the usual usage sense, I am always keeping properties at the heart of it. And uh, typically I would keep one property in focus, but sometimes you may have synergistic multiple properties improving when you go down to the nano scale. We had talked about three terms in the previous slide, uh, it is worthwhile to mention that what is the basis of definition of these three terms and we should not confuse uh, one term with the other. The three terms we had considered based on atomic order was crystalline, quasi crystalline and amorphous. And in this context we had clearly said when you are when you are defining these terms, we would worry about atomic entities what or what we call the geometrical entities and also the physical property or we could even be talking about both of them put together. And crystals are based on a lattice of course, a more formal <coughs> and rigorous definition of a crystal is, is an asymmetric unit plus a space group and in conjunction with what is known as Wyckoff positions which assign these atomic entities onto <coughs> the uh, space group positions. But we will use a simpler understanding here in this course a simplified definition wherein we are talking about a crystal to be a lattice plus a motif because it is usually more accessible to a <coughs> general student. <coughs> a crystal is ordered and periodic and we had already mentioned that the order we are talking about is orientational and positional and but the heart of the definition of a crystal lies in its symmetry and the symmetry as I pointed out can be captured by the term which is known as the space group. But for now since we are sticking to the lattice plus motive definition we have to note that a crystal is typically uh, has rotational symmetry or inversion symmetry or mirror symmetry in addition to translation. If a crystal has only translational symmetry it has no other kind of symmetry like uh, no rotational symmetry, no um, <coughs> inversion symmetry or a mirror symmetry or you can even think of higher order operators like screw symmetry or glide reflection symmetries. Then such a crystal having only translational symmetry is called a triclinic crystal, but typically crystals have higher symmetries than what a triclinic crystal would have like for instance a cubic crystal can be given a symmetry of course, this is not the only symmetry a cubic crystal can have this is the highest symmetry a cubic crystal can have. In other words this is what is called the holohedral class of cubic and a cubic lattice would have this kind of a symmetry and whenever you see a 3 in the second place and this is what I am writing as the Hermann Mogwan symbol 
Harman Mogwan symbol for representation of point groups, then I clearly see that it has got higher symmetry than this that of translation and whenever I consider a crystal, the kind of rotational symmetries which are allowed in a crystal are 1 obviously, 2, 3 and 4 and 6 and no other symmetry rotational symmetry is allowed in a crystal. Of course, these symmetries can be normal rotational symmetries or they can be what we may call a roto inversion symmetries which are given a bar symbol like instead of having 1, 2, 3, 4 and 6, I could also have like an 1 bar, 2 bar, 3 bar, 4 bar or a 6 bar symmetry. Nevertheless, the presence or absence of these symmetries is not going to destroy a crystal, but the absence of translational symmetry is definitely going to destroy a crystal and this translational symmetry is otherwise has been called the periodicity of a crystal. And typically crystals are periodic in three all the three dimensions, but we can also think of crystals which are crystals in lower dimensions like a graphene sheet can be thought of as a crystal in two dimensions. Therefore, crystals are those which at least have translational symmetry, but typically have higher symmetries which include rotational symmetries like the two fold, the three fold, the four fold and the six fold. On the other hand, there are other states of matter like we have the quasi crystalline state which are not periodic, but which are ordered. The kind of order which a quasi crystal displays would require little more thought and little more description and I am leaving out for now for that kind of a order, but this kind of an order we are talking about is typically the kind of order you would see in a Penrose styling or what you might call a structural analog of a Fibonacci sequence. <coughs> but the important point to note regarding quasi crystals is that quasi crystals can have those kind of symmetries which are allowed in crystals. Of course, they may have crystal, uh, allowed crystallographic symmetries like uh, the four fold or the six fold, but more, but in addition to these kind of symmetries, they may have symmetries which are disallowed in the crystallographic world. For instance, a quasi crystal A quasi crystal may have other kind of symmetries which are dis disallowed in the crystallographic world like a 5 fold, a 8 fold, a 10 fold or a 12 fold, but more importantly a crystal has translational symmetry while a quasi crystal has something known as an inflationary symmetry. Though we are not considering this inflationary symmetry in detail, but it is just an important point to note and readers may want to look up some of the literature in the area of quasi crystals to understand that how a quasi crystal is different from a crystal. But from the per perspective of the nano world, we need to note that we could have a material for instance a polymer matrix in which I could disperse nano quasi crystals <coughs> and this would give me certain important benefits in terms of the properties. For example, this very experiment I am talking about of dispersing quasi crystals and polymers not necessarily of uh, always of the nano sized, but if you do this then such a material would have good the polymer would have good abrasion resistance and added to that instead of if you suppose you put a hard material like silicon carbide which is a crystal into a polymer matrix, it will have also have good wear resistance, but the counterface wear will be very high. But suppose I put quasi crystals and the counterface wear would be small. Therefore, there are areas in which quasi crystals can be uh, applied interestingly. The other end of the spectrum as we saw was the amorphous phases wherein there are no symmetries present that means it is neither periodic nor is it ordered. That implies that on one end of the spectrum I have crystals which are ordered and periodic and the other end of the spectrum I have amorphous phases and often these amorphous structures are also called glasses 
<coughs> though there is a subtle technical point which can be, be used to actually differentiate an amorphous structure from a glassy structure, but for now we will not consider it from an atomic structure perspective we will treat them equivalently and therefore, an amorphous structure or a glassy structure is neither ordered nor periodic. <coughs> this atomic order automatically would translate into the kind of properties that each one of these phases would show up. For instance, we know that a crystal can have defects like dislocations and therefore, they are plastically deformable. You can easily form them at room temperature into various shapes. An amorphous phase on the other hand, if it, it cannot be plastically deformed and would typically fracture. We know that glass uh, silicate glass at room temperature is very brittle. Of course, if you heat it up to high temperatures, it can flow like a fluid, it will have a low viscosity and then it can be blown into various shapes like including a glass bottle. Therefore, this atom atomic structure automatically translates into the properties and therefore, whenever I am using any of these cr crystalline or quasi crystalline or amorphous phases, I would worry about their atomic structure. I would worry about their band structure and I would also worry about the size before I engineer a material which can then be put to good use in an engineering application. 